Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Sorry about the delay. We had some technical difficulties, but we are happy that we are here. We have Hansel in studio, and we're just going to get right to um, the interview because I have been waiting patiently, and I hope Hansel is waiting patiently to have a discussion with me because I am curious. He has done great things for his country. He has done great things for his family. And, uh, you know, it takes a certain mindset to pick yourself up each time you fall short and you keep on going. Not everyone can do it. Not everyone has the mental strength to do it. But we find that this man kept on moving forward despite all the, the obstacle that he was faced with. So without any further delay, as usual, on this show, it's not about us. It is about our guest. And I prepare an introduction. So we're just going to go straight into the introduction. And then we're going to go straight into the interview. Let's go. The measure of a man, an athlete, and a competitor is not only how fast he runs on the track, but his true worth is measured by the content of his character. Hansel Parchment, 2012 Olympic bronze medalist, 2015 world silver medalist, and 2020 Olympic champion in the 110 meter hurdles with many more accolades to come back. The question many people keep on asking is, what makes him so resilient? Why does he keep on pushing forward despite his many setbacks? What makes him so uncompromising even when faced with such adversities? What is his secret to his success? In spite of his many missed opportunities in his athletic career, Hansel Parchment has remained appreciative for the opportunity of his many successes. He continues to be grateful for life. It is with this humility and appreciative spirit that keeps him focused and committed during the many challenging times. Without a doubt, Hansel has proven to the world that one should never give up when faced with challenges. Instead, one should stay focused and committed while moving forward both in the good and the bad times. Between hard work, commitment, and dedication to being the best in his event, he has found the physical and the mental strength to overcome all things. No one can ever deny the fact that Hansel Parchment is truly a champion, not just on the track, but also off the track. And therefore, it is truly my honor and privilege to welcome this great person, at least Hello, Hansel. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. <laughs> it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you on on the program. Um, you know, normally we don't do this, but for you, we got to make an exception. And uh, before we go into the interview, is there anyone you would like to acknowledge for the help and the support that you have received over the years? And then I'll just got to go straight into the interview well first of all thanks for having me um it's my pleasure to be here as well it's a long list of people to thank uh, of course mr coleman my coach mr anderson who has always been there um, my agent now sir james family friends sponsors namely grace kennedy and puma uh yeah, and, and, and all the supporters who keep pushing and keep, you know, behind even when times are not so good. So I'm most grateful for that. All right. All right. Um, sometimes, Hansel, people see us as athletes and they think that we have good times all the time. And they don't realize that there are times when we sit by ourselves when we are not achieving our goals. And we wonder, some of us may have doubts, some of us try to figure out 
how we can move forward. So I can empathize with your situation, but you know, you are the real deal. You have overcome many of the obstacles. And today we want the audience to know more about who Hansel Parchment is. You grew up in St. Thomas, where track and field stars are not a common phenomenon in the eyes of Jamaicans. Who motivated you, Hansel, to start running track? Well, oh, one second, please, one second. <laughs> hey. I'm so sorry. So, so sometimes as athletes, we do go through tough, tough times. And it is vital that we have the right support. And I'm sure Hansel is going to share a lot of his views in terms of the support. Not a problem. I'm so is, sorry about that. Not a problem. Go ahead. Yes. Um, what was the question again? So the question Growing up in was, was, who motivated you to run? Oh, right? yes, yes, yes. Well, I'm not, I don't think it's so so much a who it was an event at Mark Bear school i think it's what year was it i know i was in second form that must have been 2003 maybe and they had a sports day at the time sports day was very big and the one on Jimita, i remember i was watching that there was a lot of people coming to the school to support the sports day which is not something you see so often uh we had wilbert walker he, I think you might know of him. Uh, he was one of the big stars at Boys and Girls Champs in the triple jump, especially. Um, there was Keldon. Uh, can't remember all the names, but a few a few guys who, to me, was some of the fastest um, people I've ever seen run. And after watching that race, I was very moved and thought, you know, I always feel like I can run fast, so. You know, I have to I have to join this track team. And the following year, in third form, I went and did a tryout, and I won the tryout. I think it was a I don't remember if it was a one hundred or a one fifty, but I won. But I was up against um, some jumpers, which I didn't know at the time because that was my first time um, going around the track, people. And I felt you know super winning my first tryout, and I joined the track team afterwards. Mm. That's cool. Um, you know, many of times we start doing something because someone inspires us. And this is why it is important that young people get a lot of exposure to things that they, they may get interested in. But one of my concerns, well, one thing I find in St. Thomas, because um, it's, a, it's an era that does not, promote track and field so to speak and you find because of that a lot of talented athletes from that area seem as if they are not able to overcome the shortage in terms of um, doing more for the people the community the parish of St. Thomas do you ever thought that it would be a long shot for you in terms of wanting to be um, an Olympian coming from St. Thomas? Not necessarily. Um, and, and you're right. There, there is so much talent there. We have so many people who could get to the highest of levels and sometimes the, the support is not as great. And, you know, a lot of people have to move to, to other areas to get that support or to get that, that push or drive. But, you know, I, I'm just really thankful that I can accomplish these kind of goals to let others see that, listen, it, it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot more to see and achieve. You know, if you if you want to follow my footsteps or, you know, not necessarily my footsteps, but just, just to be great at whatever you do, mm -hmm. um, I can be an inspiration for that. And that's great because, you know what, we had... Akeem Bloomfield on this program and one of the person he said inspired him <laughs> was Hansel Parchment and the person tried to say so what about you seeing both and he said no Hansel Parchment is the person um, that that inspired me to want to run track 
But, you know, I have friends, Hansel, who are from St. Thomas. And one of the things I find with St. Thomas, it is that largely, it's largely a family-oriented parish. What was your childhood like growing up in St. Thomas? <laughs> lots of fun, lots of... Um, I grew up close to the beach in Port Marand. So I spent a lot of time on the beach or there, there was a field behind my father's workshop and we played a lot of football there, a lot of cricket, lots of racing. You know, we, we were always racing for everything, everywhere we were going. And you know what? One of the funniest thing was most of these times that I was out playing football, my, my father would be sneaking up somewhere or, or, and, and chasing me because I wasn't supposed to be out of the shop. <laughs> and somebody would always alert me that, you know, Pachia come, Pachia come. And without even turning to see where he is, I would take off. <laughs> you know what I mean? And maybe, maybe let's say, I'd probably cover 300 meters before he ca caught up to me and yeah at the time i thought he was very fast you know probably he should have done check and feel you know but definitely family was was a was a big thing um you know the community at the time i think was very different than it is now it, it felt more like a, a community that was together you know it, it felt like a situation where other adults could you know be a part of what's going on in in other families you know, in terms of taking care of other people's children. I remember many times when my parents were working, I would stay over a um, friend's house, you know, and vice versa. And, you know, saw a lot of that happening. It doesn't seem like that so much um, as it used to be, which is really is a shame. But I hope that, you know, we can improve on, on, on that. Mm. And that is true. <laughs> well, you know, Many of us never really get the chance to compete in front of our own home crowd, so to speak, because we are from different parts of the inner city. In your case, you went to Morant Bay High School. What was it like competing for your high school in your own home parish? Well, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, how, how shall I put it? You know, as I don't know if you guys know, but I started out doing the throws, the javelin, shot put, discus. So I wasn't into running until after maybe after a year, a year and a half maybe. But I won the first hurdle race I, um, I did when I just started out at the Eastern Champs. And trust me, that was... That was a great experience. It was, how shall I say, exhilarating. Is that, that a word? Because um, a lot of the high school students were there, you know, from Mark Bay School. That's mostly what it is at the Eastern Champs. It's the, the students who are the supporters. So when I went back to my high school, I felt like the biggest thing because everybody know Hansel. Um, I think I was champion boy at one point. I was, I was getting silver medal in the 400 meter flat i was getting silver medal in the the discus i was on the four by four i did quite a bit of events <laughs> so i felt like a real star you know competing um for my Bay school especially you know fifth form and then i made the world youth team in, um uh, that was 2007 to ostrava did make the final but that was another big step for me because I, I remember the principal at the time was announcing to the school that I made the, the national team and that was just an awesome feeling. Uh, you made the decision to attend Kingston College for Sixth Farm to pursue your academic and your athletic career. Why, King, why Kingston College? Why not Calabar? Why not JC? <laughs> Well, uh, it's, it was just the upper six, so less than a year. Um, it was of, um, definitely a good experience. I, I, I was able to, to win a, 
middle at the boys and girls champs. Um, but I, I admit the coaches and, and several athletes when I went to the World Youth Game. So I thought, you know, if I should make a switch, naturally, that's where I would go because they were, were very kind to me and, and you know, kind of like show me the ropes. So when I when when I had to make the change, because my mom was moving from St. Thomas at the time. So we were making a bit of changes and I thought, all right, this, this might be the best move for me. Mm. Um, and of course, as I say, because, you know, I met the coach and uh, I think it was Mr. Russell at the time. And so many of the, of the athletes like Donna, you, I remember he was my roommate at the World Youth Games. Um, Jonathan was a high jumper. It was quite a few of them. So that was um, a natural move, I, I would say. But also a very good experience as well. Mm. Well, you, you, well, how would you compare Moran Bay High and Kingston College in terms of access to resources, the mindset that encouraged um, one to perform at their best? and the high level of training, how would you compare? It's, it's a big difference, a big, big difference. You know, I feel like um, at Martin Bay School, you would have to be, you know, separate and apart from support of like the coach, you know, Mr. Brian and the, the small team that we had at Martin Bay School. At Kingston College, it's it's a huge thing to, to take part in the boys and girls champs. Or just trap meet on a whole, and the, the whole energy is different when it comes on to competing. The, the competitiveness is very high. You have to be very serious about putting in the work because if you aren't, you might not make the team. And it's a it's a it's a much bigger team. A lot of boys competing, so it's you know like for instance in Mark Bear School, the team is not so big, so it's much easier for me to be on the team. So if if I feel like I wanted to slack off, I could and still be on the team you know what that that wasn't really the case at kc you had to you had to make sure you work if you wanted to to go but the the, the support i think is a lot bigger um like for instance the, the the past students they they come on and assist um a lot of parents come on and assist and i think that that is very good for schools you know if parents come together and you know support all the children and support the teams I feel like, you know, um, <clears throat> they would compete a lot better. Um, they, 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 they can get a lot more done like this. Um, that, that's not the case so much in, in, in Mark Bay, which would something, it's, it's something I think we should try to develop, you know, get more parents involved and let them understand that track and field can be a big help to, to your child. Um, it, it can be a way out. It, it can get you a scholarship, you know what I mean? Because um, a lot of us don't have the money to pay school anyway. So, you know, why not push them in track and field and try to help to get that balance? So, um, you know, those those were some of the, cheap, the differences I, I saw. Mm, and those are great things. And I really hope those people who are in authority would really think about that. Because, you know, for me, I never had my mother... At a, 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 a at a championship in Jamaica, the first time my mother saw me compete was at the Olympic Games in 2000, closer to the ending part of my career. So she never had the chance, mm. and it's not that she did not want to, but you know she just didn't have the time to leave work and do all those things. So those are some mm. valuable points, um, Hansel. Excellent points. And I, I, I hope that those who are listening will, and parents who are listening too, will know that they can make a difference by just showing up. Yep. If you could pinpoint one thing that made you that better after attending Kingston College, what would that be? Or would you say it was a combination of things that helped you to excel at the level that you did? It's, it's definitely a combination of things. I remember getting injured while while we were having a weight session at Kingston College, and you know I, I had a, I had a lot of assistance, especially from from Bertram, 
and you know even even the coaches there like mr jeremy they you know they, they did a lot in terms of getting help for me in terms of treatment and so on and you know at one point i thought i wouldn't be able to compete at champs and training was going so well i was um in good shape and i was ready to compete in the, in the hurdles and of course i would have to would have had to fight for my spot because at the time it was kiran i think kimali and there was there was somebody else as well and you know, it was it was just it was a it was a tough setup but um i would say just learning resilience mm -hmm. i think that that was one of the main thing you know after such a situation and i feel like i've carried that with me because i have from that same injury a lot of spill off injuries came you know and that's the funny thing injuries sometimes just don't want to leave yeah and it bring on so many other injuries and you have to really find as many ways as possible to manage it and um you know try to you know record things and learn as much as you go along to mm. to definitely. prevent other injuries definitely and we're going to yeah. talk about that we're going to talk about that because that's something that i am curious about too um i was talking to your coach and he told me that you used to do the hip at kc and i know that when a person does the hip it's absolutely no cakewalk what kind of monumentous mindset <laughs> one must have in order to compete in such a sport much less to win the event talk to us hansel <laughs> we, we, we have to thank um mr brian for that um, that was my coach at martin bear school at the time um he was the one who put me up to to doing so many events he thought that i would be the perfect candidate for it because as i said i started out throwing um i don't i don't think i was particularly good at throwing but i think i did well enough um and i was able to learn the other events like like the high jump the long jump from from mr brian and mm -hmm. going to casey he was just adding adding to what i already learned or adding to the foundation Mm. Um, adding to the strength and i was able to pull through the winner despite injuries and you know I, i've always thought to myself maybe if i if i wasn't injured i would have been able to to drop some some records and so on <laughs> but that that was not the plan god had in store mm. well uh, and and this is where we lead by faith you know faith can lead you down a path you don't see it in the moment but with time it will manifest itself in other areas um were you offered any scholarship to go overseas after you left kc or did you attend college in jamaica unfortunately i didn't have the scholarship opportunities uh i think because i i got injured and and wasn't able to run the hurdles and perhaps the the hip um did not look as appealing as the other events. Not sure, not sure. But um, because through Bertram, I went to to UWE and was able to get a scholarship there. And you know that's where I went. That's where I met Mr. Coleman, and he has been my coach ever since. So I would say that that was the best move of my life. You know, if you tell somebody that the Olympic champion in the 110 hurdles did not get scholarship offers to go overseas they would say it is not true you know uh, <laughs> but it's a wonderful thing it worked out in your favor you were able to still reach your highest potential shortly after um the expert says it the coaches says it hansel that in track and field one of the most crucial move that affect a lot of people is the transition from high school to college how smooth was your transition from high school to the university of the west Indies? um i would say pretty decent 
uh, I think Mr. Coleman is a patient man. I, I think you know, and you know he he put things together just at the right time because the following year I was already making um, national teams. And I was already cutting down my time. I remember he was telling me that if I wasn't improving in the one thing, I would have had to run the 400 meter hurdles. <laughs> and everybody know that running the 400 meter training for that is is unbelievable. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm a pretty tall guy, and and sometimes I have on a bit of weight. And when I have to come around the track two, three, four times, it it's not nice at all. Mm. So I I had to make sure <laughs> sharp, I sharpen up things for the one thing because I, I, I there was no way I was going around that track for so many <laughs> times. Yeah, man, and um, I kept I kept lowering my times each year. I kept finding ways to improve on my technique, and I work closely with coach. And you know, each year, each year we were able able to improve. So. I could stay away from the 400 meter hurdles. <laughs> hey, that's a good strategy. A good strategy to use. Well, without a doubt, you know, Hansel, you started improving rapidly, and now the world will know that it is because you did not want to run the 400 meter hurdle, and that's a very good strategy. You started to improve so much. You made the national team for the Commonwealth Games in 2010. You made the CAC Games in 2010. You finished fifth in both event. What was the experience like? What did you learn? And how much did you learn in that moment? I think after, after the Commonwealth Games, I remember I met one of the British hurdlers and you know, he shared a few pointers with me because I, I had this problem with, with getting back to the ground um, after each hurdle. You know, I always felt like I would get the, the lead leg up really quickly, but wasn't able to get back down to the ground as fast as, as I needed. And after talking to um, Lawrence Clark, that's that's his name. After talking to Lawrence, um, he shared a few things with me and, and I figured that, all right, let me test this out. And after testing that out, I, I found myself getting back to the ground a lot quicker than I used to. And I kept I kept dropping the times. You know, another thing that that helped me to improve as well. You know, I would I would reach to midway down the race, and I would hear a coach in my ears shouting, "Drop the arms, drop the arms!" And immediately I'm catching up to everybody. You know, so those are a few other things that 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 happen in this time. Um, of course, I learned my start my start was terrible, <laughs> and. I needed to find a way of of um, getting up to the front, knowing that it's so difficult to to get up into my running. And how I did that was to improve on my technique. So over that time, I I worked a lot on technique. You know, so mm -hmm. that that's that's you know that's what I worked on it to be able to to win races and and catch up to people when I was so far behind. Mm. Well, without a doubt. The evidence speak for itself because in 2011 you represented your country again at the CAC championship. You represented your country at the World University Game, and you won both events convincingly, impressively. In your own words, Hansel, how differently did you train, and how much stronger did your mindset grow to manifest such great victories? Well, I feel like the mindset was always strong and i think when 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 you are around like a person like mr coleman you tend to to get even stronger you know i, I learned a lot from him and the, the training was always vigorous um, most of the times i was training with the 400 meter guys so that was another tough part of of the of the, the whole um journey uh I didn't do so much sprinting, so I, I had to be strong if I wanted to be a challenge to, to the 400 meter guys. But um, as I said, you know, just being around coach and, and, and Bert and you know, the people I have in the circle have helped a lot in developing that strong mindset. Mm. 
True, true. You transitioned to the professional in your last year of college. And again, you represented Jamaica on the biggest stage of track and field. In 2012, Hansel, you won your first Olympic medal in London in the 110-meter hurdles. What were some of the mental and the physical challenges you were faced with on that journey? Uh, I, I, can't, I can't think of any challenges. I think that that year I was in tip-top shape. I was, I was running um, my best times. I, I ran 48, 44, and 400 in the early season. You know, I felt my best. In, in 2012, I was I was beating the 400 meter guys in in the 300 meter time trials. Um, I was on top of the world, to be honest, and I was having a lot of fun. Um, I remember in the heat in the heats first round, I was just enjoying myself going through because of course me and coach talk and he said you know you don't need to power through you just need to be in the top. I think I don't remember if it was top three, but just once you're up in the top, you don't need to waste too much energy. And you know, I came through. Same is I got the up the, the opportunity to compete with one of my I'd say role models at the time because I, I used to watch Robles. I thought he was like one of the smoothest hurdlers, and I always wonder how he's able to to glide so smoothly over each barrier and run so fast. So you know, I was very fascinated by that. So I was really excited to run the semis with him and i remember getting up to about a hurdle eight and i think he realized i was catching up to him and then he had to because he was i think he was trying to ease back now you know mm -hmm. the race under control and he realized i was about to catch him yeah and he had to step on the gas again to, to get to the line and i, and I just started laughing <laughs> I, I i had everything under control you know i the crowd didn't phase me. Everything was good. But in the finals, everything changed. Uh, I don't know what happened in the finals. I was nervous. And I was nervous the first two rounds. Mm. Uh, my, my, my body suit, um, <laughs> the shoulder part twist up. And the whole time I was standing at the line trying to straighten it. And I still didn't straighten it. I'm, I don't even know what happened while I was trying to straighten that. But... My mind was was all over the place. I think my race plan went through the door. Mm. But when the gun went off, it was just instinct. And I, I, I run my best race. I, I got a PR. I think if I was relaxed, I might have run faster. But it was still a very good experience. Um, of course, I was a little bit disappointed that I didn't run faster. But first, first Olympics, first medal. You know, not, not a lot of people can say that. So, you know, that was mm -hmm. awesome. And that was a great accomplishment too because, you know, even though we had heard last before, you you kind of set the bar higher for those who were supposed to come behind you. So you're the first, and the history books will show um, that you have helped to change the mindset of the hurdlers that you are competing against even right now. In 2013, you competed in the World Championship where you were not successful in making it to the finals. I must acknowledge that you have your fair share of injuries, which we'll talk about um, later on. And I know that it is one of the most challenging things for athletes who are faced with injuries in order to overcome that. But what do you think contributed to those injuries which were major setbacks? And what did you do to change that reality to be as successful as you are right now to be honest i've had injuries you know plaguing me for quite some time because since 2013 i think i've in i've been injured almost every single year i've not had a year that i was injury free so i was just battling with injuries and um i think for this year i i, I it, was a lot of knowledge piled up until now and i was able to you know to just get a better understanding of myself get a better understanding of um what 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 i'm doing to cause these injuries or what am i doing to to prolong these injuries um 
and what are the, the, the better or the best treatment methods to focus on. And, you know, I think I've put everything together where I have such understanding of it now. You know, I'm much better able to, to go through a situation if I'm injured and, and you know, be ready in time. Because mm. I think I understand it, especially the mental side of things where, you know, don't focus on the injury, don't focus on stressing, don't focus on the negatives, you know, just focus on what are the methods that I can use to, to get rid of this, to, to get to where I want to go to. Mm -hmm. That's where that's where I've been, or that's where I get I got to, um, mm. based on the years of, of ex injuries. And, and 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 it shows because you came back two years later with a bang, and in 2015 you won your silver medal at the world championship. And I always say it that mindset is everything. And you talk about your mental strength, but what level of mental strength and preparation? And I want you to let the audience know: Does it take for one to be so great at making comeback like the ones then that you have been making? Uh, uh well let's say experiences you know teach wisdom um i've i've had a lot of a lot of experiences especially outside of track and field as well that a lot of distractions that i use to teach you know um i started to do a little bit of a reading i started to listen to some audiobooks and you know, come to the realization that there are some things that are just out of outside of your control. There's nothing you can do about those things. And the things that are in your control, you can change them. You can improve on them. That's that's where your focus should be. And once I realized that, thing, things were much easier um, to get done. And, you know, that's where my focus... Um, that's where my focus is now, and that's what I keep telling like my training partners and friends. Like, don't stress about the things outside of your control. There's nothing you can't do nothing about that, right? Um, and if you if you focus on that, you lose half your mental energy wasted on something that you can't do anything about. So, the things that you can control, you just keep tackling those, tackling those, and finding uh, methods to keep tackling those and, and just building on yourself. And, you know, one, once, once you, the more aware you are of, of, of yourself and, you know, your surrounding, it, it makes it a lot easier to, to overcome mm -hmm. certain things and, and accomplish goals. Mm -hmm. in, in, and, and that is so true. And that, that's, this is why they say that experience teaches wisdom. And I know that a lot of people out there, they do, they don't know what to do but you yeah. are proving it that your method works. In 2016 at the Rio Olympics, a lot of people had high expectations. What happened, my brother? Talk to us. Injuries, on top of injuries. Um, I was nursing one injury because I, I had a great background season. I started the year running some fast times and then the injuries came on. It, I think it was it's the same injury that I've had since high school that decided that it wanted to, to bother me. And then out of nowhere, something else happened. A brand new injury came about. And I think it came about while I was trying to strain areas to to take off some of the pressure off of the old injury. And I guess I did a little bit too much and made things a little bit worse. So I wasn't able to, to push through. So I had to give up my spot to somebody else at the time mm. but another teaching experience yeah and and that must have been tough because you know when you work so hard and you have something in your reach you want to experience the good time but yeah. you know but it is good that you have that humility and and i think that it helped to to push you forward in terms of perspective you know, you had the right perspective and I guess you can live with yourself because you know that you did everything that you could do. 
But in 2018, Hansel, you rose like the water of the riverbank to win your, your silver medal at the Commonwealth Games. How would you describe your feelings running such a solid race after going through 2017 with the ups and downs? How would you describe? That, that was also another great experience. Um, we had to, to get ourselves ready a little bit earlier than normal. The Commonwealth Games was what March was it? I think so. Much earlier, uh, I think I did a pretty good job to get myself ready. It wasn't perfect, it wasn't perfect at all. Um, still had a little bit of struggles in, in getting the technique right at the time, but um, I think I ran a solid race. And you know, there's always room for improvement, but you know, I'm very thankful I was able to come through and, and get a medal and you know make the country proud, make everybody proud. Well, I can tell you this that we are all proud of you, Hansel. Um because you know, as an athlete, sometimes we see the glory, but we really don't understand what is in the athlete's mind. And this is why I wanted you on this program too, because I know you're a quiet person. I know you don't always like to, to, to talk about some of the things. But if you had something to say to some of the athletes who found themselves in similar situation like you, what would you say that they can take away to say, look, if I have these injuries, if I don't have people in my corner, if I need some encouragement and some support, these are some of the things I can do. What would you tell them? Well, I think, I think you know, you should take some time to think about what you really want to do. What, what do you want for yourself? What, what are the goals that you want to achieve? Um, you know, take some time away. Take a walk, you know, go somewhere quiet, you know, that's, that's relaxing, you know, take, take a small book and start doing some writing, you know what I mean? Perhaps do some thinking first, some deep thinking about your situation, where you are, what is around you, and then, you know, take your book and start jot down some things. Um, what do I want to achieve? You know, short-term goals and so on, long-term goals. Uh, you know, just, just write down, you know, some of the things that, that has happened before that you want to change. And then after you figure out the direction that you want to go in, the next thing is to now figure out what part do I need to take to get there? What are some of the things I need? Like one of the things I did was to assess like, some of the bigger athletes who are always doing well. What what are they doing different? Why are they able to be consistent and always winning and always challenging for top spots? And I started looking into that and then looking to myself. Am I doing these things? Do I have these things um, for support? And you know, obviously, if I'm not at that level where they are, I need to change these things. I need to have some of these things in order to get to this level mm -hmm. so that's the approach i took and i feel like that is what you know at least need to think about if they really want to be competitive and and, and challenge what else but more consistently rather than you know one season you do well and then you're off for so long and then at one season you know to maintain consistency so you know, it's about thinking about the, your direction that you want to go into and, and figuring out the path to take and then start challenging yourself and making those changes and, and being more disciplined. Mm. Mm. Well, I can tell you that those things worked for you because I can tell you that if your name is not the comeback kid, my name is not Dr. Hart because you have been coming back time and time again and it shows that you are the real deal. You came in third in the Jamaican Olympic trials, only to turn around and dominate the field to win your first Olympic gold medal. What was your preparation like mentally and physically 
answer that helped you to achieve such tremendous performance in the 110 meter hurdle? Um, I, I knew what I wanted, you know, for, for this Olympic year. I, um, unfortunately, it didn't happen in 2020. And I had a lot of time to, to rest my foot because I had some problems with the ankle in 2019 and it didn't seem to want to go away. And I think 2020 was a blessing in this guys. I got a lengthy rest, you know, to get the, the foot to recover properly. And I had a solid background season. But then I think it was in end of February, March, early March, I got a stress fracture in the same foot, the same foot I've been resting with the ankle issue. And um, I was preparing so well, I was fit. You know, I was looking forward to running my one four hundred for the season, hoping that I would run at least a forty seven something because I thought it was time now to run faster than forty eight. And I was thinking a lot about that while you know, you know, doing my background programs because I really wanted to break that forty eight four time. You know, so that that was one of the things that contributed to to my fitness um, earlier in the season. But then after the fracture, I thought, you know, um, I'm not able to run on this foot. I, I really need to go back to the drawing board now and, and you know, rearrange things and see what was the best strategy to, to come up with. And, you know, after a while, coach was very worried because, you know, time was flying by and I wasn't able to do any running at all. Everybody else was running fast times and showing, showing what they're made of. And I was in the background trying to find a way to get back but you know as i said before i can only control the things that are in front of me and the things that are out of my control i don't focus on those so i was i made sure i get to the got to the gym and i did the excess the exercises that were possible of course i couldn't pressure the foot so like no squatting no deadlift none of these things i had to do other exercises and i was in the pool almost 24 7 doing other work trying to keep the fitness up you know because it doesn't matter what kind of work you're doing once you hit the track again is it's like a brand new thing yeah you know what i mean sure. it still still burn you know what i mean it feels like you're unfit even though you've been doing other things but i kept on working kept on working um ran the first two finally was able to start some running again and you know we decided that all right based on what's happening let's not go around the corner let's just stay on the street and, and see how best we can keep the foot i had to wrap the foot every time i, I go out you know i mean I, I had to be finding all different types of insoles to to see how much i can cushion the foot mm. because i was feeling pain the whole time you know i mean i did like three mris on the foot i went to see doctors chiropractor um you know, Dr. Neil Gardner did quite a bit of work as well for me. Um, when we did the scans, the doctor looked through it and thought, all right, next three, next two weeks, I think he said, and I should be good after the lots of rest I was doing before. Two weeks passed, three weeks passed, and this foot still in whole heap of pain. There was one point I was wearing these big shoes and it seemed as if it was bringing on a whole different injury because my back started hurting me, mm. you know, because I've on these big shoes and now I'm uneven on, on, on walking. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to try to find a more comfortable shoes and, and take off this big boot because this is just making matters worse and I can't afford a new injury while trying to fix this old one. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I just kept on working every day and I kept telling coach, don't worry, coach, we're going to do this. Everything is going to be fine. I just need to to qualify and once i qualify we have a little bit more time to get things in order mm -hmm. you know what i mean i think you know coach even coach said it when i came back to to start running again he said yeah man you look you look like you've been doing some work <laughs> you know you could see that work was being put in i wasn't home getting fat and you know i was i was just ready to to go out and, and just dominate the thing and when I got that qualification, um, of course, you everyone heard about the little rumblings that took place at the whole third place thing. And 
I wasn't even worried about that, to be honest. I, I wasn't even thinking about that at all. I was mm. just waiting to see what what the outcome would have been. And I I, I remain confident. But of course, everybody was talking about it and it was this big thing. But, you know, I, I didn't focus on that. It's not like it was in my hands anyways. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, yeah. yeah, they decided that, you know, it should stay as it is. And I was able to go out and, and do my thing. You know, um, and that was a good decision. I know that the way you guys, all three of you guys competed, it would be tough for them to reverse anything. And you're right. The mind of a champion is to control what you can control and let the chips fall where it may. I was listening to an interview that you did. And you it, it was with The Observer, I think. And you said that, in the competitive world sorry let me let me just move position slightly not a problem all right in the interview you said that in the competitive world it is filled with many challenges yes i would like in your own words to state some of the challenges that you're talking about and explain to us how you were able to overcome many of these challenges well, there, there are so many challenges with, with track and field, and we know injuries, those are the main, the main types. And as at least we face injuries all the time. And it, I think it doesn't matter what the challenges are, it all comes down to just your mental strength, your focus, your a group of people that you keep in your surroundings. Um, the distractions, that's that's perhaps the next biggest thing next to injuries. And a lot of us are so distracted by what is going on around. Um, I think sometimes, you know, we, we get complacent. We forget that we need to do this. We forget that we need to do that. Um, there are times we, we're listening to too many different people. Um, you know, challenging the coaches too too many times, and, and you know, a whole host of things keep happening that is taking you away from your 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 um, track that you should be on, your line that you should be following, and it, everything comes down to your focus. Everything comes down to your dedication, what you really want, and. I think if if you're able to to, to you know just get gather your, your thinking and, and and realize that you know all these things are taking me away from the part that I want to be on, mm-hmm. and, you know, keep get yourself back down to the ground, you know, and just um, put these goals down and you know put this 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 part down and realize that all right this is the direction I'm supposed to be going. But based on everything that's happening on the outside, this I'm going in a whole different direction. What I need, what do I need to do to come back here? And as I said, sometimes you need to have that that, that keeps reminding you that this is what you need. Or sometimes um, we learn the hard way. You know, some hard time might hit, and you realize, wow, um, things aren't going so well. I need to. I need to get myself together. I need to pull up my socks. So, you know, those are some of the the, the challenges I see. Mm-hmm. Um, where especially track and field and sports on our whole is concerned. Mm-hmm. You know, Hansel. One of the things I have been trying to do is to get athletes to study more, to learn more, to be able to better articulate themselves. Because when you have that knowledge and that experience about life, you're able to dominate your event and you can inspire more people. So I am totally impressed with your outlook on life. And I hope that more of the athletes that we have coming up will take on the mindset because the mindset that you display right now to the world it is no accident why you are an Olympic champion. 
Olympic bronze medalist, world silver medalist, Commonwealth Games medalist, etc., etc., because it is your outlook on life. And it is true that talent means nothing if you're not able to make the right decision. I'm going to give you my last question so you can go. Um, and I know you expected this. We are all grateful that the volunteer in Tokyo helped you to find your rightful destination because you were able to put on a show, the show of your life. So we are grateful to her for that. But in the spirit of honesty, Hansel, what really happened? I also want to know deep down, the deep gut feeling when you found out that you were at the wrong place, not to mention how far you were from the right place. Talk to us. <laughs> You know, I, um, I, of course, you know, I've been asked this question so many times now, um, every interview. But um, let me tell you the story. I came out listening to some music, some Kirk Franklin, um, you know, because my, my mom is always playing, I was always playing Kirk Franklin when I was much younger. We were living in Portland. So um, I'm not even sure how I, how I came up on... Um, that music but in the morning preparing to go out i it just came to mind you know and it, maybe i need to listen to some of this and, uh, and that was a vibe at the time so i started listening that i came out got some breakfast and thing and i linked the coach um it was okil stewart at the time and they had some kind of meeting so he couldn't come out at the same time because we would have been going to the chat you know, together so he said, just go on ahead. Um, I'll, I'll just come and meet you a little bit later after the meeting is completed. And I had the music in, went down to the, the bus stop. Um, of course, saw uh, Athletic Stadium on the on the stand. But afterwards, I found out that on the bus itself, there is a sign where this bus is going. But I wasn't looking for that. Normally, that is not even the case because, you know, every day we went to training, we just look at the bus stop and see, okay, this is where the buses are for the athletic stadium. So I just went on the bus, um, sat right at the front, down in my phone, trying to, to select and, and find some more music. Then I see a girl walk down with a long thing in a pouch. And I was wondering, where is this girl going? I turned back and looked at her to see where she was going. And I realized nobody, nobody else had anything like what she had. So I thought, um, kind of strange, because it didn't look like any implement for track and field. So it wasn't until uh, my head was down for most of the, the time in my phone. Uh, and then and I finally look up and I realized this bus, the, the place don't look familiar. I said, all right, let me let me just go and watch a little bit and see what, what what's taking place. I realized I start seeing like some industrial places and things, like factory looking places. And I don't remember seeing anything like this before. <laughs> um so I start text okay at the same time. I said, okay, you know, if it don't look like I'm on the right bus, um, I, I think I might be on the wrong bus, you know. And him, him said, Don't panic, man. Um and him send me the head coach number. Um, Mr. Wilson said, so just link him just in case maybe we can set up something to get back quickly. And um, I started to see the water now, and I was saying to him, No, we definitely don't. I'm definitely not on the right bus. And you know, of course, he must say, Don't panic. We are, we are start out him, know yourself. And I was cool for the most part. Um, and he said, Just as I, as I get there, just jump back on the bus to come back to the village. So I get to the destination now and I realize this is a, a aquatics place. It wasn't until way after I, I, I found out that it's for rowing. So jump off the bus now. Um, I wasn't panicking. I was, you know, I had things under control. I went to, to talk to the first lady and she didn't speak any English. So she took me to the one person who, who um, could talk English, which is the, the volunteer, Tiana. And... I tried every method to, to get to the athletic track and I was watching the time the whole time. Um, you know, they ha always have like sponsored cars and things. So I was see trying to see if they would give me one of those and that, that was unknown. They, they didn't even entertain the idea because it seemed as if 
as, as you know, they're very strict um, with, with rules and, and so on. So there was no way, because you'd have to book it from way before to be able to get the car. And the bus wouldn't take me to the athletic stadium. So she, she was the one who actually mentioned taking a taxi. And I was like, but I don't have any money. Why would, why would I even walk with money? And I'm going to the track, you know what I mean? And she's saying the only way you can get back basically is to go on the bus. And the bus don't, they don't leave same time. They wait until, you know, they're leaving. I think it was maybe every half hour or something, something like that. So I eventually went back on the bus and sat and I was thinking, um, how, how, how am I going to do this now? Because, you know, and it's a good thing I leave really early. I think I, I started leaving like three hours before race time so I can get to the track and just chill a little bit, you know. Coach is always saying get to the track early and just relax, you know what I mean? And, you know, just get into your zone and things. So thankfully, I, I, I left really early, so I had time. But I know if I had to wait on this bus to get back to the village and then to the stadium, that would have cut down my warm-up my warm time. I probably wouldn't have any warm-up time at all. So I decided, you know what, let me go back outside and ask if maybe somebody can give me some money. And I went directly to the, the English, the girl who could speak English. And she kind of hesitated at first, and then she kind of hold the money under the phone and passed it to me. I don't know if they must have... Um, they were being watched or something, man. As you know, them, them people are very serious over there. Um, she gave me the money, and of course, I don't know where the taxis are, so I had to ask her for assistance with that too. And, and then she she was taking me over, and we were talking, and, and I even told her that my sister had the same name and thing and thing. Uh, we, got, we got to a security point, and she couldn't come out because she had the, the radio thing on her. And she ran off and tried to give one of the other security people if they could hold it. None of them would take it from her. None of them. So she couldn't put it down with anybody and she couldn't go out. So she had to ask this other guy. And the guy took me to the taxi and tell him what, what was um, where, where I wanted to go. And um, I, I told her thanks and that I would come back. And she was saying, no, no, it's okay. I don't need to come back and whatnot. So I said, no, man, I'm going to come back, man. Jump in the taxi. I said, all right, everything good now. May have extra water and things. So may I sip my water and eat two banana and thing and relax in the taxi. And the taxi man I press gas now, you know, because I don't know, maybe the guy told him something, but he was driving quickly. Um I realized I start to get to familiar places now. So mm. yes, I'm on the right track. I'm going to the stadium now. And then we hit a, a line of traffic. And that is when the, 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 the panic set in. I start to text O'Keele again. I say, boy, they're in a traffic, you know, it, it, it don't look good, none at all. No. I say, just don't worry, man. It's soon reach and pin on your number. So I start pinning on my number from early and drink up all of the, the fluids that I, that I had in my bag. Start sweat now. So, you know, say, just the fretting alone, you know, a part of the warm up that. And luckily, we, we got through the traffic. Um, there was another worry point because when we get to the, the point where the bus normally turned to go towards the stadium, you know, no other vehicle can pass it so because they block, all of the police then block off that area. So the man drive up. Fortunately, this was one of the special taxis that have on all of the stickers and things that are allowed in you know, the Olympic area. So the guy let him pass and I, I got in and I got through security. Normally, I'm not put on my bodysuit until I finish my warm up. <laughs> and me I both go in because you know, I want to sweat it up. But this time I think I had like I think I had like 45 minutes or less. Um I think that would have include call time. So I had to do a very quick warm-up. I had to put on my body suit at the same time. I never have no time for the regular take time warm-up that I usually do. But thankfully I was able to put everything together just in time. And I, I had a very teaching semi-finals because I was able to observe Grant and, and see some of what he was doing so I could make adjustments for the finals. Mm. Well, I tell you, Hansel, I was happy. I know anybody in your situation, they would be nervous like crazy. I would have lost my mind because that is something that was out of your control but god is good he blessed yes. you he gave you that opportunity 
and we are all grateful for that. Hansel, I thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate your honesty. Um, you are an inspiration to so many people that you don't even know. So I urge you to continue to stay focused, continue to represent your country, continue to represent your family, continue to represent your parish because you will always be from St. Thomas. Yes, Thank you yes. very much, my brother, for accepting the invitation to come on my show. My team, we are all grateful for you to be here and we wish you all the best, Hansel in everything you do mr anderson if you are watching i appreciate your help mr coleman mr coleman was my coach too so i'm sure he will tell you more about our interaction yes, thank yes, you very yes. much for coming um hansel and may god continue to bless and keep you and the family safe thank you very much same to you and have a great evening all right thank you very much right. thank you respect, very much. respect all right thank you all for coming we appreciate you taking the time. Sorry we had some issues earlier today, but we were able to resolve all of our issues. For those who were late, you can always go back and watch. If you like the content, do not hesitate. Share. A message like this needs to get out because Hansel is telling you about his mind. He's telling you how to think because if you want to be a champion, you must think like a champion and do the things that champions do. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate the support. May God continue to bless and keep you all safe. See you next week. Next week, next week, this time, we have Justin Gatlin in studio. We are going to go deep into Justin's mind as well. So we look forward for you being here next week again. God bless you all. Good night.